Buenos dias. Good morning. Here we are. Um, we're now back into the regularly scheduled agenda. Uh, on your uh, agenda, section 9A, uh, we have tech edu ed authority um, update. And Ray was going to be here, but I think we got Scott Smathers uh, stepping in. So, Scott, we look forward to your update. going well good morning as you said chair frederick had an issue uh, he needed to attend to so he sends his apologies and asked me to fill in this morning uh, therefore i'm going to refer you to page 168 of your book uh, and get started with the update the tea this year uh, has has done uh, a lot of things with the hope that the projects will continue to grow and expand over the next few years. For instance, work was done with Commerce and KSDE in developing definitions and the processes for work-based learning, which includes apprenticeships, internships, things like that. Uh, now the TEA wants to work with these entities in the expansion of apprenticeships and internships throughout the system. And we'll talk a little more about that in a minute. This year, the cost model was reviewed, as, as uh, many of you are aware. And not only with TEA members, but also with the two-year colleges, as there were questions regarding both uh, the sources and processes that are used within the model. Explanations and clarifications have been given, and the TEA plans to review the cost model, extraordinary cost program reviews in the new academic year. Of course, this in no way assures that the results are going to be what everyone wants. However, everyone should at least now know where the numbers are coming from and how they were calculated. The TEA continues its efforts regarding Excel and CTE fee review and is supporting the new statute, SB 123, that passed this year, which allows Excel and CTE students to ask the high schools to pay for their credentials. Uh, as part of this effort, a new credential list is currently being developed in combination with the State Board of Education and other entities. Speaking of KSDE, uh, the TEA, uh, well, more emphasis is being given to improve the program alignment uh, with the post-secondary institutions based on industry and business input. Uh, included in this effort is the, it will be establishing and publishing best practices that increase the number of credentials and, and everything that's going on and, and how we can improve it at the, both with the schools and at the institutions. In addition, the TEA has expressed a strong desire to improve communications with the high school. This year, uh, the, the two-year colleges were allowed to put all of their online Excel and CTE courses on the KBOR website, and next year I would expect that we'll try to expand that so Excel and CTE fees will also be on the website, and the credential list that I just mentioned will also be on the website. So just trying to increase our communications with the, the KSDE, um, and not just at the superintendent level, but down to the principal level, which I think a lot of times is, is key to make sure that the communication is, is getting through to the students. Based on the input from based on input from the community and technical colleges, the TA is also working to determine the best way to record and promote uh, participation and emphasize the value of the customized training that the two year colleges are providing to business and industry. Uh, with the new legislative funding that was just granted to the two year sector, the TA feels that this is going to be even more important to be able to show this value. The TEA is very excited to support the rebound in participation in adult education. Uh, we're very excited about the growth that's being shown there right now and also the use of the micro internship programs. And you will see in our legislative ask, budget ask, that uh, the TEA has, has will be requested additional funds for that. And then as, as you are probably aware, a bill was submitted last year which would have dramatically changed the TEA structure. While the bill did not pass, uh, discussions are beginning to look at the TEA structure with the idea of seeing what, what enhancements, if any, can be, 
can be uh, recommended. Obviously, any recommendations that that are created will be coming back to the board uh, for for your review and consideration as well. And then lastly, I wanted to let you know that uh, Keith Humphrey, who's the president and CEO of Jet Airworks, was elected as the TEA chair for the upcoming year uh, with Ray Frederick serving as vice chair. And with that, I will stand for questions. Yes, Regent Benson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Scott, we, we've had conversations, especially related to the D Diploma Plus uh, effort that we've, we've spoken about so much. Um, one of those components being a, a credential of, of some sort. I'd be interested in your thoughts or, or somebody from the TEA. Are there particular credentials that we should focus on? Is there something that is uh, more attractive to the business community or, or whatever the case is? Um, or should it just be a credential of any kind? Or are there some that we should focus on? Yes, and I, I think this list that's being created right now, for instance, with SB 123 and, and some of the others are, are probably, I'm hoping that that list will focus the, the items and credentials that maybe uh, would be more of a focus. There are literally over a million different credentials out there. And uh, many of them, while nice to have credentials, you won't see any job postings that say, I, you need this credential to be employed. I'm not saying that they don't bring benefit to the student. I'm not saying they don't bring biz benefit to the business, but they're nice to have credentials versus credentials that business and industry are asking for. So what we've done is we've actually gone through and using the Excel and CTE credentials that we're currently charging students for, as well as looking at the programs that we've aligned uh, we have about 25 programs or so that have been aligned where we get business and industry involved who tell us exactly what they need and what they don't need. We've used that list to, that's what we're using to create this new credential list that, that we're getting. Now that is just for CTE programs that in no way is related to, uh, you know, if you're, if you're moving on to, to other degrees. Uh, like accounting or something like that, that doesn't necessarily involve them. There are also, though, and, and you do need to know, in some, some of these areas, there are no industry credentials that that people are asking for. And so that that creates a little more of a challenge in some of those where maybe the college the college credential would would play a role. Um, and then and then I'd also say that that um, with some of these credentials, uh, uh, you know, they they you could build on them. And so those are also ones that are that are being looked at as well. So so I would say it's kind of a combination of all of all of the above, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for Scott? Mr. Chair. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, Scott, thank you so much and to the TEA for their continued leadership. My my question is really around fees for CTE and whether or not we have a understanding about how fees might be preventing access for some of our students. Um, so what's, what's your thoughts about that? Is our, our fees still continuing to be a barrier that we need to address? I would say yes, but the, but the problem is, is that uh, what we have limited the fees to items that the students walk away with, okay, that and credential tests. Now, the SB 123, uh, as an example, we know that there are students who will not take uh, some of the certification tests because they can't afford them. So now that this SB 123 is passed, they should be able to talk to their high schools about the possibility of paying for those. But you still have books, tuition, um, uh, items like that, that are out, well, I'm sorry, not tuition, but books, uh, uniforms, tools, things like that, that the students are still having to pay for. But you have to understand that while in some cases we can get classroom sets of these things through Perkins and some of the other sources, there is no funding stream form. So either the college has to eat that cost or the student has to pay for it. But I, I would also say that some of the institutions have figured out how to go out and either get donations or figured out inside their system how to actually pay for it internally, while others, uh, just to build the student. And so it, it it really varies institution by institution as far as the fees. And also though, uh, you know, it is it is determining how where is the funding going to come from because 
somehow the funding has to come for those fees. Would it be possible for TEA to give us a sense of the number, fiscal number that we might need in order to close that gap to understand what those fees are? And so if there is an opportunity to advocate for funding that we could do so. Would it be possible? Yes, I, th I think we could do that. Any other questions? Thanks, Regent Lynn. Regent Nelson. All right, Scott, you still have the comm for the next one, receive healthcare workforce recommendations. All right, well, in this room, I have, uh, I believe, five experts who, who know more than, than I do. I'll introduce them in a second. So I'm, I'm gonna be the one talking, but if you get into real detailed questions, I'll be, I'll be looking behind me for, for some support. <laughs> Uh, one of the board's goals this year was to work with industry partners to develop initiatives that will help address the state's healthcare workforce shortages. And with that in mind, uh, we created an advisory committee uh, and, and that was charged really with creating a list of realistic recommendations uh, that will help Kansas increase the number of working nurses in our state with a focus on areas where the nursing shortage is most critical. This list was to include but not be limited to recommendations on how to expand nursing education programs in the state. Sides board staff, members of the advisory committee included Jaron Caffrey from the Hospital Association, uh, Joyce Grayson, who was unable to attend today, from the Rural Health Education and Services Organization, Kathy Cottis from Barton Community College, uh, Sally Maliski from the University of Kansas Medical Center, Carol Moreland from the Kansas Board of Nursing, and Mary Carol Pomato from Pittsburgh State University. Dr. Smathers, could we invite your team to come up, at least be behind you so we can engage? Of, <laughs> yeah, would yeah. you all mind coming forward? We appreciate your work and we want to engage with you. That, that's my team, though, always on the back row. That's the way we all operate that way. That's it. Always <laughs> Thank you so much. Actually, it was it was kind of funny. We were this is for this, this team met and I was going to say this. We met multiple times to create this list. And um, but we were actually introducing ourselves for the first time face to face with a few people today. On, on the discussion, so much of it has gone on through teams. So, uh, as I said, we met multiple times and the recommendations have been broken out for you uh, by responsible entity uh, for your consideration, beginning on page one, 176 of your board packet. Uh, as you see, the focus of the recommendations are based on the workforce education and student recruitment, items such as pay and working conditions for the private sector, medical workforce. We did not include, as we felt, that is really a individual business decision and we had no, no uh, place in telling individual businesses what, what they needed to do as far as how they needed to treat their employees. I don't plan on going through every recommendation with you and, unless you want me to, but uh, I did wanna mention a few of them. The first one being that, and, and you heard this kind of from a TEA recommendation as well, as recommended by the Governor's Education Council, the Kansas, post-secondary, the TEA in partnership with KSDE should develop a healthcare pathway programs, mentoring and outreach starting in middle school and continuing through a bachelor's degree. Pathways will need to involve associated career and technical student organizations as they are really directly involved with this effort. In addition, um, they need to you know, they, they need to be expanded. Apprenticeships and internships need to be expanded to help students succeed and better provide an idea of what's involved. Also, as, as you know, uh, students learn different ways. So some students are gonna learn a lot better through the apprenticeship and internship process than just directly through education. You all know that Kansas is not a, really attracting people from out workforce, people from outside of the state. So our feeling was is that we need to really grow from within. Uh, we realize this is not a short-term solution, but we're hopeful that this will create a continuous workforce pipeline. Uh, we feel also another recommendation was we feel the Board of Nursing and the Board of Regents should create a committee to examine the potential 
for enhanced education program alignment of the associate degree in nursing and the bachelor of science in nursing curriculums, as well as their associate prerequisites. This alignment would enhance the ability of students in the programs uh, to actually be able to, you know, a lot of students come in and say, well, I'm just going to go for my RN. And then they say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and get my baccalaureate. But if they don't have the right prerequisites, they have to take some of the basic prerequisites again before they're able to go for their baccalaureate. So this would enhance that and improve that effort. Um, in addition, it would make it easier for our programs to uh, ensure they have the ability to, to share resources and faculty on an as-needed basis. Working with the Kansas Board of Nursing, we also feel the Board of Regents should considering offering programs that allow students to get licensed as mental health technicians. There's currently a major shortage in the state of Kansas for it. My understanding is the one, the one place that was offering the training does not have the staff to offer the training courses. So we continue to drop in the number of qualified people. We are fortunate in that, assuming that there is an interest in moving forward with this recommendation, we've already had two institutions that have expressed an interest in offering this program. And we think we could actually move this program forward fairly quickly. We believe that the nursing initiative grant should be increased from about 1.8 million to $10 million. And with a portion of the funds being allocated to multi-year commitments and also to helping with the National Council licensure examination preparation and programs. Dr. Mary Carol Pomato was involved in the creation of this fund and is gonna give you, I'm gonna step aside and let her give you a little uh, more detail as far as the reasoning behind this recommendation. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to highlight the advisory committee's recommendation to advocate for increasing the nursing initiative grant funding amount to $10 million per year. As you're aware, the shortage of nurses has been a long and ever growing threat to the delivery of quality health care across the nation. I have been a, a nurse for many years now, and the vast majority of the years that I have been a nurse, we have been trying to address the nursing shortage across the nation. In an effort to ease the nursing shortage in Kansas, the nursing initiative was funded by the Kansas legislature in 2006, with funding being directed to the Kansas Board of Regents for distribution. After the board submitted a report to the governor and the legislature describing the resources needed to increase the capacity of the state higher education system to educate more nurses. That initial state investment provided funding for nurse educator service scholarships, nursing faculty salaries and supplies and nursing equipment and facility upgrades. The facility upgrades were targeted um, primarily to, uh, as I remember, to um, um, enabling institutions to gear up for including simulation and te uh, technology at a, an even greater uh, level uh, in programs. More recent grants have funded program national accreditation support, NCLEX score improvement strategies, new faculty salary support, professional development, simulators, curriculum development, consumable supplies, and virtual reality clinical simulations. The current funding model has been instrumental in expanding capacity and education of nurses for the workforce but there are a few factors that are currently at play that are diminishing its impact. First, equipment, supplies, technology, simulators, all of those things, including the costs of educating students, have dramatically increased since inception of the funding. Second, there are more higher education institutions that are eligible for the funding. And third, the costs of preparing students to be successful on the National Council licensure examination, NCLEX, uh, that has, uh, those costs have really escalated. A larger pool of funding would allow for a portion to be targeted to larger scale and multi-year projects. 
An example might be a scale up of tutoring and support for students at higher risk for failure on the NCLEX examination with initial outcomes being realized over two to three years, perhaps a statewide nurse educator professional development uh, initiative. Another example might be the development of certain capabilities for simulation requiring a multi-year strategy for funding. The Kansas Board of Regents staff has been instrumental in providing oversight for funding awards and holds programs receiving funding to strict standards of compliance and accountability. They also offer tremendous support to the institutions. Outcomes are closely tracked and reported to you, the board, as well as periodically to our lawmakers. With last year's nursing initiative funding approaching the $2 million level, the addition of $8 million will allow for an even greater impact on enhancing the nursing talent pipeline for Kansas business industry and the health of Kansans. Thank you. Thank you. We also um, continuing on, raise that back up, sorry. Continuing on, um, I wanted to, uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, and, and you all are aware of this already, that we believe there should be enhanced funding to help with the recruitment and retention of nurses. Uh, too many instructors are leaving the state or going into the private sector because uh, we just, they're, they're just accepting more lucrative offers. Uh, I don't believe there's any surprise, as I said about this. I just think that, uh, you know, the discrepancy in pay between the private sector and, and the public sector is, is very large, and, and it's very difficult for us to keep faculty. Another recommendation is that a committee of healthcare and education providers be formed to create a universal student clinical onboarding process and compliance document for students and instructors involved with the nursing programs. Establishing a criteria uh, would, would um, allow students standard, you know, establishing these things would lessen the administrative burdens on both the institutions and the clinicals. In a nutshell, standardizing the requirements would create a generic set of requirements and a simpler standard process for everyone. Right now, even, even to the point of different clinical sites require different vaccination requirements. And so how do you tell the students what's required and what's not? If we could create the standard set, of, that would make a big difference. We also believe that a Kansas Center for Nursing Leadership and Workforce should be created. You have a brochure on your table. Uh, this facility would not only serve as a data center and research repository, but could serve as a resource for pursuing large statewide healthcare workforce federal grants. Dr. Sally Maliski is one of the leaders in this effort, and she's going to explain the recommendations a little more to you on that topic. Thank you, and good morning to all of you, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, as you've heard, we are in crisis when it comes to the nursing workforce in the state of Kansas. Um, certainly, you've heard that from Mary Carroll. We know that uh, from Carol Moreland. And as such, as we were looking at this crisis, certainly it existed before the pandemic, but was exacerbated tremendously by the pandemic. Um, we felt it was time to stand up a center for nursing leadership and workforce. Kansas is one of only 10 states and DC that does not have a nursing workforce center. A nursing workforce center will provide a central warehouse for data that now is housed in disparate uh, entities to bring together to, to examine that data to get a good understanding of what, where, and how resources are needed, programs are needed, and to provide the evidence that will support um, programming, policy, and evaluation to improve the pipeline 
to work with both our academic institutions at all levels, supporting the recommendations that Scott has talked about, um, and, and looking at how we work in our healthcare systems to better and more efficiently uh, deploy our healthcare workforce. We do this through collaboration. The center is a collaborative point. Uh, we are currently working uh, with multiple stakeholders, having uh, stakeholder meetings across the state to identify needs, pain points, uh, and to gather support uh, for this center. I, I have to say the Board of Nursing has been very supportive, KDHE, insurance companies, and multiple other uh, uh, sources and collaborators and stakeholders, including our practice partners in KHA. Um, so with that, I will let you read some of the facts and figures that are included uh, in the brochure and we'll be happy at any point to, to try to answer questions and, and give, give you further thoughts on this. It's a center for Kansas, for Kansans, and for the health care and well-being of every resident in Kansas. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then the, the sorry. And then the last thing I just wanted to mention real quick um, to you all is the, the last recommendation I did want to touch on is we believe that uh, the Depart Kansas Department of Aging and Disability Services should allow CNA students and, and work to help figure out a way for CNA students to perform their clinicals at locations other than long-term care facilities. We're not saying they should not perform it at long-term care facilities, but we're also saying that maybe there are other locations that they also could perform their clinicals at because too often students feel and believe that these facilities are really the only opportunity for CNA students as they, uh, you know, as, as in, in a career. And in reality, there are many other healthcare opportunities uh, that they can pursue. I am happy to report that a test is currently being run at a hospital, um, and we're going to see how that might work out. Uh, this hospital has long-term care as well, and we're, we're, as I say, looking forward to seeing the results, and uh, we'll be following up on that, but I, I wanted to raise that issue as well. And with that, we would welcome your thoughts and questions. All right. Thank you all for your service. This is really good. Um, Thank you, Scott. What questions do you guys have for Scott or the committee? Yes, Regent Benson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and again, great work. Um, I'm curious, um, I'm familiar with the, the number of nurses that are leaving the field mid-career. How are our numbers on the pipeline? And, and how have those changed over the last five to 10 years? Carol, you want to take that one? This is why we got the team. Good morning, Carol Moreland from the Board of Nursing. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here and give you some statistics. Um, I'm gonna start first with the number of qualified applicants that the schools have had. However, they were unable to take these. A big part of that is faculty, not enough faculty. Okay, in our practical nursing programs, it was 429. In our associate degree programs, it was 614. And our BSN program is 290. We are seeing a decrease in graduates coming out. And of course, they're not all staying in Kansas. Um, you know, something that we have as far as licensure, we have the multi-state license now, which is great. It's been wonderful in the pandemic but it also makes it very easy for nurses to travel. And that means outside of Kansas. And unfortunately, uh, if there's nothing to hold them in Kansas, what they're gonna do is they're gonna travel where they can get the most money. And it's very easy to do with that multi-state license. But don't get me wrong, that was a great thing that we did. 
but that has played into this also. But we have seen a decrease. I don't have all those numbers in front of me, but okay. there is a decrease. Yeah. And, and a follow-up question, how is our capacity? And, and so you may have just answered it with the, the instructor question. Um, so theoretically, we could be turning away potential nurses because we don't have enough instructors for all of the students. Is that correct? Yes. What has played into that has been instructors and clinical sites. Yeah. And I think the clinical sites are a little bit better now. You know, the pandemic was very difficult on nursing as a whole, but also nursing education. They had to totally change how they taught. And unfortunately, during that time, they also lost some of the ability to use clinical sites. So they had to switch to like simulation or something. And um, so, you know, I will tell you, they have a lot more seats than they're able to fill. And if they want to increase their seats, all they have to do is bring that uh, request to the Board of Nursing. And as long as they have the faculty and the resources and the clinical sites, they're usually approved because we understand that there is a need to get more out. So. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Flanders? Yeah, so uh, I, I believe our local hospital here is now importing uh, nursing talent from, um, from other countries. So I was... You know, I think to your point, it's uh, we need to really think about how we increase the capacity mm -hmm. in terms of our faculty. So you talked about that there were some limitations for students in programs because of faculty. Is, is some of our limits on faculty at the colleges, do you feel like, are we paying enough just to be candid? No. I mean, if they can leave and they can go out in the private and make more money, uh, a lot of them are. It's not easy to be a faculty. You know, they may think that they want to go into it. They get into it for a little time and they're like, no, this this is not what I want. Uh, so they leave. But I, I do believe they're underpaid. So I'd like to dig into that. We'll, I'm going to ask our team to do a salary survey and just see exactly where we are in terms of um, nursing faculty. Uh, in terms of compensation and see what the gap is, because it, it seems like there's students waiting to get into programs. We've got a critical shortage and and we just need to we need to bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. Regent Lane. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the information that you're bringing forward, even though it's startling. And as I think about, as I age, getting closer and closer to needing nursing care, 53,000 vacancies by 2026 is alarming. So uh, I'd like to take us back to the increase in the nursing initiative grant. Uh, could you help us understand the scale of the impact that we think that that level of increase would bring? And then concretely, not... Uh, how do we tie a, a request for investment to deliverables of the number of people that we think we can produce? With X amount of money, how many new nurses can we bring into the system is another way to think about it. <laughs> you have to come to the mic. Uh, I think that those are some of the details that that if this is um, uh, something that the board is willing to advocate for, that we need to get those details together um, and really uh, have a well honed um, message on on what that level of funding would do. As we all know, um, lawmakers have uh, lots of good places to uh, um, fund, um, put put uh, Kansas resources, and um, we would really need to to have a well sorted out message, as as you well know. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, one of my perspectives on on the nursing initiative, and I, I'm just speaking uh, for me, is that um, I, whatever the solution is. Um, it needs to be broad based. And the nursing initiative has um, um, in these last years, as I understand it, has been funding year to year. Um, and um, each year you make a request and you get funded for one year. And that does pose some challenges with hiring faculty, 
um, you know, when you're hired uh, with grant funding um, and, and nurses uh, have the ability to make um, greater salaries outside of nursing education, that does pose a reluctance uh, to step forward and, and take uh, that kind of position. Um, Pittsburgh State's been pretty successful, uh, but we also produce, uh, we're educating nurse educators uh, so that, and, and we're um, educating uh, DMP students. Um, and we have in that program an educator um, emphasis that is available in addition to the clinical program. So we don't have some of the challenges that some of the other schools do, um, but um, being able to fund at least uh, on a multi-year, uh, maybe a three-year basis, a position I think would open up um, the ability to be able to market that position a little bit better that um, uh, we you know, can assure that we at least have funding for um, X number of years. Um, I think that there are things that probably in the nursing initiative, we could build so that institutions maybe could uh, be funded um, in partnership um, for a particular initiative. Um, but just the whole cost of NCLEX preparation, um, supporting students through their nursing programs because they're highly stressful. Um, in many cases, tutoring, uh, students uh, for competencies, uh, integration of competencies uh, prior to taking the examination and going out into practice, because there's an integration process that has to take place, that's becoming far more expensive. Um, so if we can articulate that story of, of what these extra dollars would do in terms of us being able um, to realize some of um, the gains that um, we're seeking outcomes. I, I think that uh, those are things that we need to, to develop. Uh, honestly, as a group, you know, we batted around, if I remember right, you know, what, 5 million, 4 million, 20 million. Um, you know, I don't know that 10 million is the magic number uh, because we didn't really cost all of that out in particular initiatives and, and uh, possibilities. Um, but I think those are things that we would be willing to help um, the board uh, and board staff uh, to accomplish that in the next few months, if that's a, a, a position, a recommendation that that resonates with with you, the board. Does that Thank you very much. Somewhat uh, helps the end. I, help I, I appreciate that approach of a team sitting down being really thoughtful about how we put together uh, of that package. And then uh, secondary, Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, thinking about this uh, nursing center, is there a relationship there? And uh, the same kind of questions come to mind. What's the fiscal note that we need and how, how much can we produce from that? So I would encourage us to really think about that as a priority. Well, thank you for that question. Certainly a broad relationship. Um, uh, what Mary Carroll is talking about, uh, developing the metrics, collecting the data, analyzing the data to understand um, the fiscal implications and uh, looking at how we look at return on investment takes data. And that that is something that the uh, Nursing Workforce Center, uh, one of the aspects that it, it would help with. Um, I, I think much of what we're talking about uh, with the Nursing Workforce Center would be the data that would support evaluation, uh, not only of development, uh, but the evaluation of these efforts and the development of the metrics that would be needed for a uh, systematic uh, development and evaluation of what works and what doesn't. Any other comments or questions from this board? Um, really thorough and thoughtful. So I appreciate that. I think what's best for us to do is take these recommendations and begin consideration of them at the retreat and then to next year about what we want to, how we want to take them, how we want to move forward. So um, it's a really useful foundation for us to build off of. Um, so thank you for your service, the recommendations. Um, yeah. 
It's very good, very helpful. So, thank you. Yeah. And thanks for letting us move you up to the front row. All right, Tara, we're going to receive the Applied Kansas All Star Award winners. Boom, boom. Morning. Yes, it is my pleasure to come before you this morning and present your 2023 All-Star High School Award winners. Um, just, a, I guess, I'll, let me see if this is working. Maybe. Oh, there we go. So this is a program we started last year in 22 um, as an offshoot and optional recognition program through the Apply Kansas uh campaign. So uh, schools that register for the Apply Kansas program, they do an application event in the fall. And if they choose to do a FAFSA completion event and then a senior signing or a college signing event in the spring, and all three of those events happen in the same academic year, they can be recognized as an all-star high school. So last year, we recognized 54 high schools in our inaugural year. And this year, we have 97 high schools, so that's very exciting. Um, and just to kind of refresh your memory on each of these events, the Apply Kansas event happens in or around October. That is an application event where um, largely school counselors are making time out of the school day to support their seniors in completing college applications or sometimes job applications or military applications any type of post-secondary planning path, um, helping seniors think early in the fall about what comes after high school um, and then supporting them in their path and that. Um, and then um, next comes a FAFSA completion event. And so those events, sometimes they happen at the Apply Kansas events. We have schools that will pair those two events up together. Um, and then sometimes they can, those FAFSA events can happen in the community. They can happen um, at an institution, a local institution. They can, sometimes they pair up between high schools and sometimes they happen right at the local high school. So there's a lot of different ways those FAFSA events can look. Um, and they can happen anytime between October 1 when the FAFSA typically opens through February, the end of February even. Um, and then the last event is probably the most varied and, and maybe the most fun is the senior signing, college signing day event, which happens around the National Decision Day of May 1. And that's the universal um, deposit day for, for universities across the country. And this is when you, you get to celebrate all of the decisions of the seniors. And so really our only requirement is that you celebrate all the seniors and you celebrate all the choices that they made. And this is where they get to tell everybody what they decided. So whether it's um, going to a technical college or going to get their associate's degree or going out of state to a four-year university or going to work um, with their parents um, after high school, it doesn't matter. All of those choices are worth celebrating. And it's so cool to see how our high schools choose to do that in a variety of different ways. Sometimes it can be on a bulletin board. Sometimes um, it can be through... Um, a uh, uh, senior honors and awards night. There are so many different creative ways that our high schools choose to do this. Uh, I, you can even see on the, the slide there, one school did little bitmojis on a map. So she did bitmoji cartoons of each student on a map of the United States and of Kansas. So uh, it's, it's really neat to see the creativity that our, our schools come up with. So these are... Uh, we designed this program because these events we feel like are uh, our best practice uh, events that built over time and done year over year, not only help teach seniors and help support them in their path after high school, but also help educate the underclassmen and help them get excited about waiting. Well, when's it going to be my turn for Apply Kansas? And looking and learning about all the different things that they can do by seeing it through their peers, right? Because a lot of times high school students don't know what they don't know. They know what their parents do. They know what 
Um, they, they know what their, their friends do. They know what their family does, but they don't always know what's out there and what's possible. And so this is a way to see what their peers in their high school are choosing to do. So, um, so by, by being able to put these out there, it really gets the underclassmen also excited about what's possible. And so we want our schools to do this year over year because as exciting as this is and as big as our numbers are, we know that we're still in enrollment decline. We know that. And this is one of those pieces that put together with all of the other things that we're doing is going to help turn us around. So last year, we had 54 high schools. 45 of them are back this year. And so um, I'm going to be mailing them a sticker. And you can see the star sticker right there. They're going to get a 2023 star sticker to add to their, bull, their uh, banner from last year. And you, you saw the example of the banner outside as well. Um, and so every year they get to be recognized as an all-star high school, they can add a sticker to their banner. And there's our 45 high schools from last year returning. And this year we've got 52 first time high schools that will be getting their very first banner to hang in their high school and to start their, um, their recognition program and hopefully add some stars as the years come along as well. So You've heard enough from me. Um, now you can look at the list in your in your board book. That's on page 181 of all 97 high schools. But better than that, you're going to get to see the list, and you're going to get to hear from some of our counselors and hear about some of their events and um, and and learn about why they do what they do because that's that's way more exciting than what I can tell you. So here are your 2023 All Star High School. We've been participating in the Apply Kansas events for the past several years now. We feel that the events are very valuable to our seniors and our seniors feel like they're also very relevant to what they're needing. I think all of the all-star events are great for kids. Uh, apply Kansas gets them started with help to uh, apply to colleges. Uh, the FAFSA work night is probably most appreciated by the parents uh, because they could use help and advice and just encouragement. We held our Apply Kansas Day in October where we reserved our school library so all seniors wanting to fill out college applications could do so in a space during school hours with the support of myself and other staff members to help them with any questions that they had. Of course, they got all of the Apply Kansas swag and we took pictures of them with pennants and celebrated them on our social media pages. This event gave our students time during the school day to complete what could be a daunting task with the support of staff members. For our Apply Kansas Day, uh, our seniors were able to come out and participate. Um, we had Employee State University and Flint Hills Technical College come out to help us um, to get kids to complete applications. And there were kids who applied to local universities, to private schools, to community colleges, to technical colleges, beauty schools, all types of programs. Um, and lucky for us, Emporia State Federal Credit Union gave us two $250 scholarships. So for every application a student submitted during that event, their name was entered into a drawing for a scholarship. This was our first year to do the Apply Kansas here at our own school. We participated before, but with other schools. Um, we felt like it was really valuable because we had community members and college representatives, uh, board members, teachers, staff, um, that all came out and supported our students and we celebrated them. And so we have the community college from that we partnership with, Sewer County Community College comes and their financial gals come and help us out with FAFSA night. And we've had near 100% attendance with our seniors and their parents and their mentors coming to that night and getting those questions answered and getting those FAFSAs completed that night. This year, Olathe South hosted our FAFSA completion night where we brought over 13 different financial aid experts from local colleges and universities to assist our students and families um, in navigating the confusing process that is the FAFSA. Um, this was an awesome opportunity for uh, students and families who are unfamiliar with FAFSA to have assistance um, navigating the process, but also start connecting with 
representatives from their future schools. So one of the all-star events that we wanted to highlight was our college signing day with our students. And we had several of our most recent graduates uh, sign on to different colleges. But what made that signing day special and possible for our students was we did a campus-wide college visit day where we had all 72 of our students go and experience a college of their choice um, to be able to go and um, gain those new experiences. And those opportunities allowed for those students to actually come back and um, take part in those signing days. We have a signing day for every one of our seniors and whatever it is their choice is for their post-secondary plans. So maybe it's a four-year university, a two-year community college, the military, a mission for their church, maybe they're going into the workforce. They have a table set up to honor that choice that they've made and that commitment that they've made for post-secondary. They get to be honored at that and they sign a contract with their mentor that they've had for the year that says, I'm not giving up, I won't quit. I know that I still have a partnership with you after graduation, you'll continue to check on me. I think that my favorite event is the Senior Signing Day event. On this day, we bring all the students to the auditorium and we get to celebrate the seniors' next steps. This might be college-bound seniors who maybe sign one of these pennants up here. It might be students going into the workforce or seniors going into the military. Whatever their next steps, we want to celebrate all their hard work and dedication. The senior signing is the one that the kids enjoyed the most. I struggle getting kids to get things done all year long. Senior signing, they all got done in two days. I just have them do a Google form uh, that tells me their plans. I print off logos, they sign the logos, and put them on the bulletin board. We really feel like all the events that we do for Apply Kansas are so important to our students because they need that assistance getting through the FAFSA process. They need the assistance of applying for colleges. There's so many different things that all of us have questions for on that. College applications and financial ed aid applications can be a little confusing and overwhelming. These events help provide school and community support for our students and their families to work through the applications and answer any questions that they might have. Not only do these events prepare our students, but celebrate their commitment to continuing education. This is our first year to be an all-star school. We feel like providing our students with academic opportunities that build on their strengths enabling them to make informed choices about the possibilities after high school, as well as surrounding them with people who cheer them on should be our top priorities. I'm so blessed to be part of a team that celebrates students every step of the way. We are happy to be Applied Kansas participants, so we get a lot of value out of it. And those are your Applied Kansas All-Star High Schools. Right? Questions for Tara or comments for Tara? Yeah, great job. Yes. Who's your winner? Thank you, Tara. Great job. To see the addition of these uh, schools is really heartwarming. Um, with respect to the few that dropped out, was there any particular one reason that, that caused them to drop out? I'm, I'm not exactly sure, uh, you know, as far as the nine that we, we, you know, didn't, didn't follow through from last year to this year, I would expect a little attrition from year to year. Um, so, you know, when I look, looking at the numbers and I would hope that we'll see a good high rate of return each year. And then also looking at the numbers, um, 97, uh, total is about 48% of all of our Apply Kansas schools. So I think in year two, looking at that as a percentage of the entire campaign, I'm pretty pleased with that amount as well. And so I hope to see those numbers continue and, and hopefully grow as our campaign grows. We're at about half of the high schools um, in Kansas are Apply Kansas schools, and now about a quarter of the high schools in Kansas are all-star schools. So I think that's a that's a great place to start for the first two years. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. That's why you get this song. <laughs> All right. Had to go back to it. Um, okay. Thank you, Tara. Right. Appreciate Thanks. it. I, I say I was going to reference you, Dr. Tiffany Anderson. Thank you for being here. Uh, she's quite humble in her comments. And I don't know that we've ever met, 
but other than email about the all-star. So I'm really just here because of your email. And I would suspect that those that dropped out, perhaps they didn't drop out, but um, are still doing it, but didn't turn in the information. Like for Topeka Public Schools, here's the power in what she's talking about. Since um, Apply Kansas, this year, Topeka Public Schools, Topeka High is, first of all, Trojans go Trojans, they were on the list. Uh, and so Topeka High uh, has over $9 million in scholarships. And as of this year, 95% graduation rate, and they've been doing Apply Kansas. Uh, they're the two, three-year group. So they started when this started. That's pretty powerful. Uh, Highland Park and Topeka West are all doing the same activities across the district. So I suspect, so my first email was, did you all turn in your stuff? Make sure you're on that list next year. So I even think people who may uh, appear to have dropped off, what she's done is spark something so that everyone's doing something and likely maybe two or three things. They all want their name on that list and they want to be on that video. And so probably they will make sure they turn in those things, at least in Topeka, we will. I have to give a shout out to Rebecca Morrissey and Heather Prothy and all the counselors that make these things happen. Learning and academics, we have these uh, athletic activities and athletic bowls but we now have these academic bowls, these literal college signing days that people race to school to wear their uniform or wear their um, outfit. And so it's funny because several of the Apply Kansas participants, we had a listening tour this morning at a coffee shop. They showed up um, and I almost, I should have brought them with me here. <laughs> And we looked on the screen and said, okay, I'm, I'm not sure if this is an event for this, but they wanted to just pour into, uh, these young people happen to all be going to KU and K-State, and they just wanted to share uh, the running start that they have. These young people happen to be at one of the other high schools, but Topeka High, that $9 million, overall $13 million in Topeka Public Schools and scholarships. Talk about a running start. So thank you for the running start that you're giving schools across Kansas. Some may be on the list, but ones that aren't on the list, because of what you do, you've sparked something pretty incredible. And I thank the support for all of you for allowing this to continue. Thanks, Dr. Anderson. Thanks for showing up to say that. We got Tara and team. Here we go. Great energy. Thanks, Dr. Anderson. Have a good one. All right, uh, now on the fiscal year 2024 CEO compensation, I have a motion to make uh, for the board. Um, for fiscal year 2024, the state has provided for a 5% merit pool for most state employees and a 2.5% merit pool for state university employees. Based on their exemplary performance and after a thorough review of the relevant market data, I move that the board adopt a 4% merit increase to the current base salary of Chancellor Gerard, 4% increase for Presidents Hush and Ship, a 5.25% increase for President Muma, a 6% increase for President Mason, and a 10.2% increase for President Linton, and a 5.7% increase for President Flanders, each rounded to the nearest $1,000 increment beginning with the first pay period in fiscal year 2024. My motion includes delegating to Regent Ice and the board president and CEO the authority to negotiate any retention compensation as appropriate for fiscal year 2024. Do I have a second? I'll second. All right. First, second. Any discussion? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. That concludes the music playing and the public part of our agenda. Um, and uh, now we need to motion to move into executive session. Do I have a, another motion for executive Good session? Good question. You do. Okay, somewhere in the stack of papers. I, I'm not positive about that, but let me try and do it by memory. <laughs> I, I would move that the board move into executive session for a matter, a personnel matter, um, a personal matter for board personnel. Uh, it would include the board, the president and CEO of Flanders, uh, Pres President Hush, President Ship for portions, um, John Yeary and Julian Miller. I would suggest it is for an hour and a half, including at 12 o'clock. Did I get close, John? Thanks. <laughs> I would have wanted a little more spunk. 
All right, do I have a second? I'll second. All right. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. All right, thanks.